celebrating and saluting activism, and, and Julia and I, as, as our first act, we cut our speech. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There are some things that won't appear in the correct order in the program. That's because we had to decide on the program several days ago. So don't, don't worry about that. And I want you please to recognize previous winners of the Lilly Awards. looking to the way they practice and changing the way they practice. I hope it's the start of that. An amazing buzz, isn't there? Like, and some incredible women here. Like, the faces. There's just really, really wonderful people all supporting each other. It's a conversation we've all been having in private and smaller sectors trying to make smaller change. And now, finally, it's reached a very big public forum. And I think there's a lot of exciting things to come. Yeah. yeah just supporting women in theatre and women in the industry in general. And, uh, it's just amazing when everybody comes together, you realize that uh, the kind of strength that's here. A great result today will be equal access to storytelling in all our theaters. And that's what's gonna happen because everybody wants it. It's the right time now. I have never been directed by a woman in 27 years. I have done one play by a woman, a French woman, that was adapted by a man. Other than that, zero. I have never worked with a female sound designer. I have worked with one lighting designer that was female. I have worked with one lighting technician. No sound technicians, ever. I have worked on so many productions. Once I've worked with a male stage manager, other than that, all female. Their statistics, they are just bald facts. How much talent have we lost to chauvinism? How much talent have we lost to sexism? Why were we offered a debate? Why aren't we being offered an apology? Because if any, any institution, let alone a national theater, something that's funded by the public, anything was, was, any, was homophobic or racist, they'd be shot down, but sexism still being considered a petty crime. We call on the under the the establishment of equality for women artists. Our three campaign objectives are a sustained policy for inclusion with an action plan and measurable results, equal championing and advancement of women artists, and economic parity for all working in the theatre. Thank you. inspired by May Stolen From, Bob Dylan.
Dublin with these women from the Wake and the Feminist and their British counterparts, and I am so proud to present the first International Lily Award to the women of Wake and the Feminist. Please welcome Sarah Durkin and Lisa Tiernikia.
Welcome Academy Award winner, Tony Award nominee, Lupita Nyong'o, and the cast of Eclipse. short. <laughs> Danai has also worked tirelessly to make sure we never forget abducted girls all over the world. Though two of the Shabak schoolgirls have just been found, over 200 girls kidnapped by the Boko Haram are still missing. With all this in mind, the Lily Awards are proud to present this year's award in playwriting to my, our friend, <laughs> our guiding light, Danai Gurira. watched, she said, think of all the chauvinism that has caused the loss of our talent. And that made me really mad. Really mad. I want to thank the Lily Awards for this affirmation of my voice and my efforts. I remember coming to the Lily Awards, I think it was its inaugural year, it was probably seven years ago. And I was a guest, I was a plus one of, uh, it was awesome though, I was a plus one of Sarah Treen, an amazing playwright and now the amazing creator of The Affair. I, I sat amongst these rows, it might have been a playwrights back then, am I wrong? Uh, yeah, I sat in that theater and watched these amazing women on stage affirm our efforts and our voices. And I was so inspired by them. Um, I remember uh, Sarah Rule spoke of how she was exhausted, she just, she was breastfeeding intimately throughout the whole thing. And, uh, and I remember Lynn Nottage up there, and I remember feeling very, very affirmed as a young writer, uh, looking at them and feeling the warmth and the power and the activism in this room. I remember Julia reading several statistics that filled me with more and more outrage. Um, and then I was just a fly on the wall of the event, and I felt very thankful to be here. But then I remember walking outside and I had never met her before. I thought she was amazing. She was uh, very celebrated. But Sarah Rule was introduced to me, and she told me she had just read my play, Eclipsed. <laughs> and she told me how she thought it was beautiful and powerful and important. And at the time, um, I didn't know that the world felt that way about the work or the effort. And I remember being filled with so much um, hope, inspiration, and fuel to know I was on the right track and I was doing the right thing. And uh, even though the world might not tell you so all the time. So uh, what I've realized lately uh, is that the spirit of what I feel in me as I've been walking through this road with these plays is that of making sure, as Sarah did that day, that those coming behind me are validated. That those
those girls coming behind me that might not know what AD will pick up the phone or pick up their script, or those girls who might not know where they're gonna get the next job from or how, how much they're, how they're gonna get around that, uh, that male in front of them who uh, keeps stopping them from getting to their destiny or so they feel, or so they experience. So I really wanted to speak to those girls who are coming up behind me uh, as a way of, of doing what I think the Lily Awards does so well, which is really making sure we know we are important, we are vital, we are crucial, we are here. Uh, so I brought two girls today, Ebony and Imani, from Girl Be Heard, which is an amazing organization that allows young girls to battle their struggles through writing and performance and speak to the world. I met them, this organization in London, at a conference for sexual conflict, sexual violence and conflict, where the attempts to stop that from happening, the things that happen in clips, were being made. And I saw them perform pieces that blew me away, and I said, these girls must receive as much support as I can give them. So I want to speak to young girls like you, because you are the reason I do all I should do. You are the next generation. Your voices are so valuable and so important, and we have to have them, or where are we going to go? So I just have a few things I want to share with them as I learned um, along the way to make sure that I pass on what I have been so graciously given. Firstly, young female artists have a vision. Identify your outrage, the lack that is unjustifiable in what narratives are yet to be told. Embrace that burden on your heart to get that story told. That burden is a blessing. Then get to work. No excuses. No one in the world can do what you can do. Tell the story the way you only can tell it. So don't deprive the world of your uniqueness. This is a big one. Go where you are loved. How many times do I have to learn that? <laughs> and how often do I meet other young writers who speak of how this avenue and this artistic director and this agent didn't see something through, didn't respond the way they'd hoped and desired? Don't let disappointment stop you. Go where you are loved, where your voice is embraced, your vision is respected. It may not be where you expected or where you hoped, but it may just be where you grow and are nurtured as a writer and an artist. It may just be where your breakthrough comes to pass. Don't let disappointment take hold. It is really asinine to creativity. Our, well, it, is, it is poison to your creativity, rather. Stick to your vision and trust the right support will emerge if you keep doing your thing and putting yourself out there. And lastly, be a finisher. Get it done. <laughs> All the way. Embrace the right collaborators and get it done. Yeah. It's not for you. It's for all those other young female writers out there who will be blessed and inspired by your product. It's for all the women you will employ. It's for those whose light will shine as a result of the excellence you pursued when you put those words on the page. And it's for the legacy you assist in building that annihilates the concept that women's narratives are weak, rare, or unprofitable. So to the young woman writers and creators in this room, I speak over you the same affirmation and validation Sarah gave me that day, and I so look forward to continuing to celebrate you. Thank you again to the Lilly Awards. You are a deeply vital institution. Thank you for embracing and affirming my efforts. Jesse Muir.
Mueller has brought us the stories of two astonishing women in the last five years, Carol Kane and Adrienne Shelley. The Lillies are proud to recognize the clarity and boldness of her work bringing these pioneers, these women warriors, onto the Broadway stage. Adrienne Shelley's 2000 film Waitress tells the story of Jenna a working class waitress and expert pie maker stuck in a loveless marriage who finally finds the courage to free herself from an abusive relationship. The story of a woman overcoming domestic violence is a vital and pressing one that affects millions of people each year. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, one in three women and one in four women in the United States have been physically abused by an intimate partner. The cover of the Arts and Leisure section two weeks ago was an article entitled The Year Broadway Broke Through, in which New York Times theater critics Ben Brantley and Charles Isherwood and editor Scott Heller discussed how it was a strikingly diverse, unusually urgent season. <laughs> Sexual and domestic violence must not be urgent issues since in their discussion there was not one mention of this theme that has been an integral part of our Broadway season this year, exhibited in many productions, including The Color Purple, Eclipsed, Spring Awakening, Bright Star, Blackbird, and Waitress. Furthermore, of the artists working on Broadway this season, their conversation cites 10 male artists by name, directors, writers, actors, and choreographers, in contrast to only one female artist who is mentioned by name, okay, she's fierce, Audrey McDonald. <laughs> female artists are significantly underrepresented on Broadway, and women's stories are quick to be brushed under the rug by the media. It's time that we recognize the incredible artists, many of whom are in this room tonight, who are telling these stories in impactful ways. On the opening weekend of Waitress, we found a note pinned to the wall in our lobby installation at the Brooks Atkinson Theater. It read, thank you for saving my life. I left my abusive relationship because of this show. This was because of your performance, Jesse. You have brought this human story to life with stunning urgency and in beautiful authenticity, true to the messiness we all experience in life. The Lilly Awards are grateful for the continuing grace and power of Jesse Mueller's work on the American stage, and we proudly present her with this year's Lilly Award in Acting. Thank you. I'm a little verklempt. Um, I'm really tired. I'm really sick of wearing dresses and heels. <laughs> um, but I'm so... <laughs> oh my god. I'm so humbled. I feel like I have no right to be up here with all the people that are out here and the work that's being done. I've never thought of myself as a feminist or doing anything feminine. I just and I'm not very good with words, which is I guess why I like to pretend to be other people and depend on people like Adrian Shelley and Jesse Nelson to tell me what to say. Um, but I am floored by the response of people that have seen Waitress and like the note Diane um, read, she told me about that. And um, we got to work with a wonderful organization when we were rehearsing called Savvy. I don't know if anybody knows about it, it's through Mount Sinai Hospital and yeah. Uh, sexual assault and violence intervention, and they have a team of volunteers. Um, if you have a problem, you can call somebody, they can meet you on the street corner, and you can say, I have a bag, I just left my home. Um, they work with people that come into emergency rooms who have um, experienced sexual violence um, because a lot of the doctors aren't equipped to help them with their heads and their hearts at that moment. And these people come in and they, they save people. Um, I think one of the most important things we can do the theater is there to, to help and to heal. And everybody's stories deserve to be heard. Women's stories can help and heal just as much as men's. 
So thank you to the Lilly Awards for making this important and making this um, in people's line of vision. Um, I've always felt so fortunate in the roles that I've been able to do. I, I just have been drawn to these, these very um, wonderfully powerful and messy women. And, and I've been entrusted to portray people like that. And, and I just feel so blessed. I feel like there's so much inequality that I have never had to deal with. Um, but I know that it is a very real thing and something we need to keep, um, keep fighting for. So thank you to everybody here. And I'm also just glad to be in a room full of women supporting each other because that doesn't happen all the time, <laughs> um, especially in this business. So thank you so much. I'm really, really humbled by this. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for um, this opportunity to talk about my friend, Kate Wariski. It says, directors do not just stand around telling actors where to stand. Directors help writers to see what they've written. They help actors to understand what they're meant to play. And they help the entire team grasp what we all, as one soul, want to bring to the audience. Kate Wariski is an official major presence in the world of directing. From Shakespeare to the work of Lynn Nottage, she has brought audiences into close contact with people they would otherwise not even know existed on this planet. It's as if she's determined to get American audiences aware of the world. And she has been doing this for a long time. I'm glad to see that she's getting a, a little uh, respect because um, she's, she's the one. She got a, a note here from Lynn Nottage. It says, I wish I could be there to fetch you, Kate. Thank you for being such a dear friend, a trusted collaborator, and my sister in this artistic marathon. As a director, I appreciate that you bring great clarity and vision to all your projects. And I apologize for dragging you to unusual corners of this creative universe to find inspiration, but I thank you for being so game. She says, you dive into your work with all your heart, and you're always willing to wade into dark, unruly territory to find truth and beauty, even in the most mundane of moments. Boston tough, uncompromised, uncompromising and generous, you make your collaborators feel safe and cared for as artists. And I feel internally, eternally thankful that our paths crossed at just the right moment in our creative lives. It would have been tough finding my way through the thicket without your support. Congratulations, a well-deserved honor for a brilliant director. So for her artistry and her activism, the Lilly Award in directing goes to Kate Wersky. Thank you. I, it's, it's very exciting to be here. I've never been here before, so I'm really happy. Um, and I wanted to thank Marsha and Julia for uh, founding this idea and for acknowledging a, a gap and celebrating everybody. So, so thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful being in a room with uh, people who formed this community. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to have a little conversation with you about a, about uh, the nature of community and what women can do for each other. Um, in 2008, I had one of the most difficult conversations I ever had with Lynn Nottage. And uh, I took her out to dinner, and I knew that I had to tell her something that I felt like would end our working relationship. Uh, we agreed to meet uptown, and we spend the time between appetizers and desserts talking about anything that I could think of that was not the subject at hand. And I, I told her you know, various things about theater and gossip. I was really, so my heart was pumping. And um, she then starts to drive the conversation. She notes on Ruined, and I stopped her, and I said, uh, Lynn, and she said, no, no, no. And you have to understand, we've been working on Ruined for five years. We had traveled to Uganda. We had done endless workshops. And I t had to tell her that I couldn't do it. And I blurred out, Lynn, I'm pregnant. The baby is due in th five weeks before we start rehearsal. I can't. And she stopped me 
interrupts it and says, without a breath, well, congratulations. Welcome to the world of working mothers. I got home to my husband and he asked how it went, knowing that it was an emotional time for me and I dumbfoundedly said, well, I, I think I'm still doing it. <laughs> when I look back over the last decade, I recognize what a defining moment that was for me. In some way, Lynn made clear that who we love, who we make our family, and what we say on stage is all of a piece that we are responsible to those we love, and that responsibility translates to who and what we see on stage. Getting this award is now significant to me. In this elec election process, where floodgates of hate speech are being unleashed, I'm honored to be part of a community that is in pursuit of strengthening the underrepresented voice, diminishing the hardening of our culture, and deepening our sense of empathy. Thank you, Russell, for your kind words and friendship over the years. Thank you to the many women I have had the opportunity to collaborate with, including Julia, Julia Cho, Sarah Rule, Paula Vogel. And thank you, Lynn, for the generosity as we share motherhood and theater together. And a deep thanks to my family, Dan, Daniel, Rory, and August, who are my northern lights in defining what is significant to the stage. Um, my kids are here tonight, first time, it's kind of exciting for me. Um, so last is, after Kate's speech, this is perfect timing. Um, last summer, the Lilly Awards began rolling out a childcare initiative, a model camp where women who are both writers and mothers could bring their families and actually get work done and have happy children. We are determined that one day every colony, play lab, and theater will have a childcare policy so that never again will a woman writer have to choose between advancing her work and taking care of her children. Please welcome Emily Simonis speaking on behalf of Space Camp at Writer Farm. Hi, and thank you, Julia. Uh, as Julia said, my name is Emily Simonis, and I am the founder and executive director of Space on Writer Farm. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, we are an artist residency program housed on a working organic farm about an hour north of New York City. Uh, and last year, we had the supreme pleasure of partnering with the Lilies uh, on our first ever family residency uh, that aimed to, one, give working moms time and space to work on their art. Two, gave their kids time and space to be outdoors and play with other kids and be supervised by um, some education professionals and three, to have time to be together as a family. And it went swimmingly. Uh, I'm gonna read a quote from one of our residents, uh, Stephanie Zavracek, who I think is here tonight. She says, it was such a gift. For once, leaving the city to focus on writing didn't mean abandoning my family, nor was it a logistical nightmare of lining up sitters, pickups, and drop-offs. We all escaped for a week. The impact on my work was immediate, but the impact on my son has been lasting. He talks about the farm all the time and keeps a small tree branch he collected there by his bed, <laughs> which I think is so sweet and um, is demonstrative, I think, of, of the experience. Uh, so we came back after last year and Julia and I and Marcia talked about, you know, what we should do this year. And so we opened up an application process. Uh, and I just want to say that the level of applicants and, and the amount of applicants and the way that these applicants talked about their kids and talked about their relationship between their work and their children was um, sublime. It was really, really incredible. Um, and uh, I'm losing my thought because it was so beautiful. Um, <laughs> Oh, there we go, I know where it is now. Uh, one of the pervasive threads uh, was this, this notion that, you know, I haven't applied for an, app, uh, an opportunity like this in three years, or I haven't applied for an opportunity like this in five years, or I haven't applied for an opportunity like this in seven years, uh, because I'm a mom, or because I thought I wasn't invited, or um, because somewhere along the line, I, I made a choice to take my kids to over a residency program. Uh, and we're here to say that that's not what you need to do going forward. Um, if I could take those applications and like make a coffee table book about why this is so important, I would. Um, 
So I'm gonna announce the 2016 residents, which are Deepa Perot, Beth Nixon, Louisa Thomas Pregerson, Georgia Stitt, Sarah Rule, and their children. And, um, And I'm gonna end by saying that if you're a working mother, you should apply next year. And, and most importantly, thank you so much to Lily Awards uh, for being such tremendous supporters of this initiative, for always being ahead of the curve. Um, if it weren't for you, I don't think I would be standing up here. So thank you so much. Now in your program, you're going to find an envelope. Don't look now. <laughs> The envelope is for money that you might want to put in that envelope to help send a kid to space camp this <laughs> next year. We um, just re just remember that and let's uh, let's vote on this. <laughs> just for your head. So here to present the Leah Ryan Prize is Lily Board Member Kuti Trap. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be on both the board of the Lilies and the board of the Leah Ryan Prize, which honors uh, the memory of my dear friend. I met Leah at Juilliard uh, in the playwriting program where Chris and Marsha were our teachers. She was funny and honest and uh, an irreverent writer of plays, essays, and postmodern greeting cards. Uh, to my mind, Leah embodied what it means to be a modern woman of letters. She was infinitely curious and brave in her work and how she chose to live her life. When she died of leukemia in 2008, her friends and family created a foundation to honor her work and her extraordinarily generous spirit. Uh, each year, we award an emerging female playwright with uh, $2,500 uh, which I have here, I almost forgot it, and uh, a professional reading of their play, and we give the award to her here at the Lilies. Um, this year, we're partnering with Primary Stages and New York Stage and Film, so the prize winner will be able to workshop her play over the summer uh, in preparation for a reading in September. And also this year, the foundation, through the Authors Guild, uh, gave $5,000 to a writer facing a serious illness. Uh, before she died, Leah specifically requested we try and help writers in any way we could. So she too was an advocate. Uh, since the theme of, of this year's board is, is advocacy and activism, I would encourage you all to think about how you can be actively generous to one another in both ways, large and small. There's a lot of people doing large things here, but we can all try to do it in our small ways. It can be very tough in this business to lead with an open heart, but I urge you to take a cue from Leah, who in her darkest hours was thinking about ways she could make writers' lives a little bit better. So, in that spirit of generosity, I am thrilled. Jay, are you here? Hi. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> I haven't seen her yet, so yeah. So I am thrilled um, to uh, present the Leah Ryan Prize to Jenny Murphy for her wildly original and theatrical play, Giantess. Giantess is a play about complicated bodies, choices, and leaps of understanding we make when we love someone who is seemingly very different from us. Uh, in this play, when Dee hears a mysterious noise in the abandoned glass factory behind her house, she discovers a lost girl her own age with amnesia who happens to be 30 feet tall. Uh, Dee and the giantess try to figure out who she is, where she came from, and the nature of their deepening connection to one another. Their story travels through time and space in unexpected ways that are moving, funny, and always surprising. Jenny just finished her first year at Yale Drama School, and I don't like to boast, but this prize tends to be a sign of very good things to come. <laughs> so, I strongly urge all of you who make plays happen to hunt Jenny down in the bar after the show and read this play and come to her reading in the fall. She has a truly original and fresh voice, and I want to see her plays living and breathing on stages all around the country. 
Jenny, on behalf of the board and the Lilies and the reading committee, congratulations. wonderful and also very surreal. Um, because I'm a playwright, I would much prefer to be sitting in the dark audience right now than being on stage. But since I'm here, um, I, would, I would just like to thank everyone. And it's a huge honor to share the company tonight with so many exceptional women, artists and leaders who push forward the art form, the industry, and bring important stories and ideas into public discourse. Uh, I must thank the Leah Ryan Fund for emerging women writers for this prize and this platform. Like many women playwrights, I have struggled with the not unreasonable fear that my plays might not find a place on stage in the American theater. At times, it's been hard to quell the, the, these fears when writing to keep pushing forward an idea, a character, or a world. As an early career writer, I realize it is critical to find real allies and collaborators, and I feel so lucky to be connected with the Leah Ryan Fund and for your support and your guidance moving forward. A big thanks as well to the board and staff of the Lilly Awards for creating and, ho and hosting this amazing event and bringing so many talented and forward-thinking women into one room. I also would really love to acknowledge those who helped get me here. Um, Philadelphia Young Playwrights, or PYP, is an arts education organization, a very dynamic one in my home city of Philadelphia. I wrote my first play for PYP when I was in high school, and I later joined the staff as uh, their general manager and also as an in-class in teaching artist and dramaturg working with student playwrights in elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, PYP helped to shape my understanding of theater as, uh, as an art form that is evocative and deeply human and one that has the potential to engage audiences and communities together in big ideas. I also want to thank my family, both the family I was born into and my queer family, for their love, support, and smart counsel. You've helped to shape my brain, my heart, my spirit, and encouraged me to engage both the political and the personal in my work. And thanks also to all the teachers in my life, um, my recent mentors, uh, Jeannie O'Hare and Sarah Rule, as well as my college and high school writing teachers, Anton Dudley and Ms. Schroeder, and also to like really go back in time, my second grade teacher, uh, Teacher Penny, who told me not to worry about my terrible handwriting or my inventive spelling, and just to write, just to write and write and write every day. Um, and I'm also the daughter of two very amazing teachers, my parents, Marianne D'Amico and Frank Murphy, who are here somewhere. Um, Mom and Pop, I love you very much. You are such deep thinkers, passionate educators, funny, humble, and the coolest people I know. And I'm grateful for your faith in me, your honesty, and your love. So thank you, and thank all of you. the walk. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. <laughs> Sorry, Howard. Uh, I'm introducing the longest running Phantom of the Opera in history. <laughs> it was also sung every other beautiful role written for a man, including my own show, The Secret Garden, 25 years ago. Here is our beloved Howard McGillan. Thank you, Martha. It's great to be here. Um, Martha Plimpton has been politically active since she was a teenager. Marching for women's reprodu reproductive freedom in the 80s, in the 90s, and now. <laughs> Even now, when the battle is far from over. She has lobbied Congress on behalf of Planned Parenthood and has spoken out for women's reproductive rights at campuses and rallies all across this country. And I believe she will keep doing this for as long as it takes. God damn it. Uh, when I was asked, uh, uh, Amanda Green asked if I would uh, present this award to Martha, and I was so delighted and honored to, uh, to be asked. I've known Martha for about 15 years now. We've been good friends. We've shared a lot of birthdays and holidays together. And I know her not only to be an artist of singular quality, but also ridiculously funny. Her wit and her passion for the world we live in and the causes that uh, are dedicated to making it a better place uh, make her a role model for us all. So it is my great pleasure 
to present the Lilly Award. In fact, I can think of no one more deserving for the award for speaking truth to power. Martha Plimpton. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. I'm very uh, grateful to you uh, for those kind words and for being here and uh, for your friendship over the years and your support. And thank you all so much. Thank you to the Lilies. And uh, this is really extraordinary. And I'm <clears throat> a little nervous. Um, uh, I'm really astonished to be in all of these people's company, some of whom I know. Uh, many of whom I don't, but all of whom I respect and admire and I'm completely in awe of. Um, some of you I've worked with, um, and some of you I hope to work with. Many of you, all of you, actually, <laughs> um, if you'll have me, because <clears throat> it's hard out there for a chick. Um, thank you to Julia and Marsha for creating this organization, the entire board, for all of your hard work. Uh, in encouraging and seeking out women of vision who so often struggle to be heard. This is, of course, a vitally important mission, as we all know, and I would like to add my own voice to the chorus of those who are so grateful to you all for the work that you do and the voices that you help to amplify in the theater and beyond. In this particular election year, regardless where each of us may stand politically, although I have a feeling in this room we're pretty <laughs> safe, Uh, I think it's safe to say that issues of representation and visibility are a central theme in the public discussion over who it is we feel should lead us, who it is we feel silenced or marginalized by, and how it is that we should go about making our voices heard. Representation of diverse voices in the arts, in culture, and in political and social life is essential to influencing the course we take, not just in this election, but in life in general. And the stakes are incredibly high for all of us, but particularly for women, people of color, immigrants and refugees, children, LGBTQ Americans, and other members of our society whose most basic interests of survival and equality are under direct and constant threat pretty much daily uh, around the world and unfortunately here at home as well. And the voices of women of diverse experiences are necessary to telling these stories and bringing them to the attention of the nation. They develop our understanding of human nature and life, and they bring us closer to the empathic and intelligent society we all seek to live in. We can't afford not to listen to them, to amplify them, and to celebrate the courage it takes to do what so few others are willing to do, which is tell the stories of those without traditionally accepted paths to power. It's funny because I didn't know the name of this award, the Speaking Truth to Power thing, so it's funny that it was a, just coincidentally, I just used the word power in my speech. Anyway, moving on. Um, I am astonished and inspired by the creativity and courage of all of the women here today, and I do take a lesson from each of them that every heart and mind is capable of reaching into every other heart and mind, those of strangers, and altering, even if only for a moment, the trajectory of a single life. And that is no small accomplishment. It is everything. All each of us has is one voice and this moment, only this moment, this moment alone, which is in fact vast, eternal, and encompasses all of creation. In the advocacy work that we do for abortion rights uh, with our organization, A is Four, you can see my little scarlet letter here, we are doing our part to amplify the voices of people who've been silenced and shamed for making decisions according to their own conscience. From the Rio Grande Valley, to the Mississippi Delta, to the prisons of El Salvador, where women risk imprisonment for up to 40 years for the crime of miscarriage, to the quickly disappearing clinics of Ohio and Florida and South Dakota, 
and all of the country, really. These voices of the women most severely affected by abortion restrictions and prohibitions are rarely heard. It is our duty to give them a platform, a place to speak out, and in some cases, to speak out in their names when there is no other option, so that everyone will know the depth and the truth of their humanity, their dignity, their strength, and their right to live their lives as they see fit. I so appreciate everyone here who is dedicated to this mission of celebrating and encouraging women to speak up, to write from their own experiences, and to share those experiences with an audience that is truly hungry for more. I don't care what anybody says, they want it. They want it. So we better give it to them. Hmm. I am eternally grateful for this recognition as well, as much as I know there is so, so much more work to do. And I stand in awe, absolute awe, of the beauty of these women here, and their minds, and their willingness to keep going, their perseverance in the face of systemic and cultural bigotry and bias. All praise goes to you writers, and you makers of art, you storytellers who are making the world's soul a fuller one, and altering the landscape for all those making their own paths alongside your example. In the words of the great Lorraine Hansberry, the thing that makes you exceptional, if you are at all, is inevitably that which must also make you lonely. Well, the lilies are doing their part to make each of us feel a little less lonely, a little more heard, and a great deal more prepared to keep on going. Thank you so very much to the lilies and all of you. Congratulations to everyone. Thank you. with a tiara, sash, and flowers. But this year calls for something more substantial. Aren't you curious what this means? <laughs> Sometimes when something awful happens, you see someone set a heroic example, suffering through an unimaginable loss and coming out of it fighting hard. Norbert Leo Butts, famed Broadway funny man, has done just that. Will you join me? <laughs> he created the Angel Band Project in memory of his sister to address the scourge of sexual violence against women. We thank you, Norbert. We need you. Take our love and our joy and $5,000 <laughs> to keep helping survivors of abuse. A man who fights for women is a real man. when I have to make a speech. That's unfortunate. Um, <laughs> Rachel, would you come and join me? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Rachel Ebeling, the, the actual founder. I'm a board member. I'm a co-founder. But this is um, Rachel Ebeling, who, who is the true founder of the Angel Bank Project. Come up after Rachel. So um, I, my name is Norbert, I am a feminist, and um, um, I wish, as honored as I am to be receiving this award as badly as we need this $5,000 for organization, I wish to God, if I have to just speak the truth, that I weren't here tonight. Um, the reasons that, that, that the circumstances that, that, that brought me to this podium right now are, um, unspeakable. 
Um, there's no speech behind them, but as Rachel and I have learned, there's, there's music behind them, there's art behind them, which is, is what we're doing here and what this organization represents. Um, um, on, on the night of July 19th in, in 2009, my sister Teresa, two years younger than myself, one of my dearest friends, was along with her fiance just weeks from their wedding. She was a proud lesbian. Um, they were um, attacked in their home in Seattle, in Kings County, Seattle, um, for over two hours by an assailant at knife point. Um, they were raped in every room of their home. My sister um, began to um, demand dignity in her ordeal, managed to fight him off just enough to save her partner's life. She got out of her home. She died naked on her front lawn in the arms of a 17-year-old girl who was her neighbor. Um, this event, uh, the loss of my sister, um, meant the loss of, of many things in my life. Um, uh, and it's the nature of sexual violence, these crimes, um, there are far-reaching implications in why we must continue to fight to eradicate um, crimes against women. Um, I have three daughters of my own. Um, the statistic one in four women being sexually abused on a college campus was a statistic that got a whole new meaning for me after my third daughter was born. I thought, wow, if I had one more, I'd really be screwed. Um, and that did not sit well with me. Um, my girls were 13 and 11 when their aunt, their beloved aunt, was taken. In their teenage years, they have both suffered through um, eating disorders, self-harm, um, and, and drug issues. Um, my mother, <laughs> who was never allowed to touch her, her daughter, uh, when you're a victim of a crime like this, your body becomes, um, um, it, it becomes, uh, it belongs to the state. It's, um, it's, it's proof. My mom has never recovered from the fact that she was never able to clean my sister. She wasn't ever able, there she is, Teresa, you're still at it, aren't you? She's like, get on with it. You've said this story so many times. Um, within a year, I had to seek help in a drug and alcohol program because I was drinking myself into a stupor each night, uh, um, unable to deal with my own trauma. Um, uh, seven years of sobriety and counting, thank you very much. <laughs> um, at her funeral, I'm from a family of singers and performers. Um, I'm one of 11 children. Teresa was the ninth, I'm the seventh. Um, we'd have a lot of money. We were sort of like the Von Trapps, kind of with a little coal miner's daughter thrown in, <laughs> and just a touch of sort of Osborne family there, too. Um, we always sang together. We always harmonized at Teresa's funeral. Um, we sang. No one could speak. All we did was weep. Um, and we sang. We were able to get out these hymns that we all grew up singing. Rachel Ebling has been best friends with Teresa since they were in kindergarten. She and her other best friend, um, were, had a, 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 a vision after we left the memorial service, and then we had another memorial service in Seattle, and we all got together and sang some more. We pulled out guitars and just played her favorite songs. Um, this amazing thing started happening. People started talking about the event. People started feeling. People started expressing their grief. People started coming together. Rachel posed the idea of the Angel Band Project, which is an organization that uh, exists in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, what if we took, what if we made a CD based on the music that we had created at her memorial services? Um, we, we started a, a 501c3 and um, uh, to date we have music therapists that work with survivors um, um, through songwriting workshops. Um, we're servicing 200 women in St. Louis, Missouri right now. Another branch is starting in Seattle, Washington. Um, we have uh, great, great hopes for this organization. We do something called the virtual choir. This is a brilliant, brilliant idea. How do we connect women, these women who are silenced um, with, these, with this trauma? How, how to get them together, singing with each other, trying to make music. Um, through technology, they're able to Skype women in through and singing with a live choir, wearing um, headpieces and microphones, monitors in their, their ear. And amazing things have, have started to happen. So uh, 
that's where this money, your money, um, this organization's money is, is going to help. Um, not long after my sister died, um, two other interesting events happened in my life. Um, my wife, who's a brilliant actor, we met doing Wicked. Actually, we met doing a Julia Jordan reading. Julia Jordan is responsible for Michelle and I. Um, smoking lessons. I also just have to say, I was honored to do a play with Kate Wariski. It was the greatest theater experience of my New York career. She directed me in How I Learned to Drive. Amazing director. Congratulations, Kate. Um, um, my wife um, was a wonderful ingenue, and then she became started playing moms at, you know, the way you ladies do at like, you know, 33, you know, starting to play moms of teenage girls. And then did three, three roles on three procedurals in which she played moms and then corpses. <laughs> My wife played three corpses in television before she went into semi-retirement. I was given two scripts that pilot season after Teresa died in which I um, one was to participate um, in a sexual crime against a woman, another one investigate one. Um, both of my daughters came home from their high school cafeterias saying we can't eat in the cafeteria anymore, we're getting too harassed by the boys in the cafeteria in their public high school. So what the fuck is going on here, man? You know, I was like, and how was I blind to this my whole life? And then it, and then it dawned on me, Women have known this all along, <laughs> right? I was just getting a glimpse into the world and I was horrified by what I saw. So I'm gonna keep on singing. I sing the concerts for the Angel Band Project. We're having one in New York. We'll keep you guys posted when it's coming along. We try to raise money through the concerts um, and that goes to help these, these music therapy programs. Um, I'm really, really, really honored to be here and be in the company of this incredible room. Thank you, Ms. Steinem. We've taken so much inspiration from you. Uh, this organization has really been built on a lot of your, your ethics. I just want to personally say thank you. Um, and I want to give the mic to Rachel Ebling just for a second. Um, she's the heart and soul of this organization. Thank you so much. I just want to make a couple uh, quick thank yous. Can't really believe that I'm here to represent the Angel Band all the way from St. Louis uh, on this stage tonight. Thank you to the Lilly Awards for giving us this wonderful gift because this money will go directly to impact survivors that we work with. And secondly, Norbert, I mean, we were all left speechless after Teresa died and you know, it was really hard to kind of pick up those pieces and figure out, okay, how are we really going to move on with this reality? And Norbert was one of the first ones that I kind of just cried on his shoulder and said, can we do this thing? Can we sing and make this music have a bigger purpose than, than what it is for us? And he represents men in this movement because we cannot end violence against women until the men start stepping up and helping us end that. So Norbert has taken that stand and that's huge. Um, and I just wanna say that I, all the voices here, I mean, all of these wonderful women are using their voices either on stage or directing others on stage or writing their thoughts down. And it's so important to use our voices because I didn't know as a stay-at-home mom seven years ago that my world would be turned upside down when Teresa exited and I get to use my voice to stand up for women whose voices have been silenced. And because of that, Teresa has given me an amazing gift to share with others. So for all of you, thank you for using your voices. And for the young people here, your voices matter the most, so use them. Thank you. Uh, please welcome Nina Bieber, previous winner of the Stacey Mendich Young Writer Play Award. The Stacey Mendich Prize is not just $25,000.
It says pause for laughter, I think, because that's a lot of money, Dianu. But it isn't just that. It's an invitation into a group of writers whom Stacy has commanded to go write a play. Someone out there cares and will feed you, literally. Stacy gathers everyone who's won into her vision of, as Gloria Steinem, I like to quote, has said, women who we are all linked, not ranked. Not only that, we get to call Stacy whenever we're confused. Well, maybe not every time we're confused, but from here on in, Stacy will encourage you, she will inspire you, she will in every way be your champion. This year's winner is Rihanna Lou Mirza. got the money. <laughs> she has had readings everywhere, established Asian American companies everywhere, received awards from everyone. Now the Lilies has an MFA in revolution from Columbia. Wait, I'm sorry, an MFA in playwriting from Columbia. <laughs> she was a co-founder of the Ma Yi Writers Lab and is a brand new mom. Her baby is one month old. And one thing Stacy wanted to make clear is that writers are moms are writers, so here you are, Rihanna. Here is your check now. Go write a play. When I got the news about this award, I was sitting with my one-month-old child, and one of us was curled up in fetal position, and the other was crying that their career was over. <laughs> um, it's true. <laughs> we live in a two-playwright household, and my husband, Mike Lou, and I would often joke that we're doubly fucked. Um, <laughs> double the rejections with half the bank account. Um, and as the woman, apparently I get two-thirds of those rejections and one-third of the bank account. <laughs> Um, it, it's easy to feel forgotten as a woman of color in the theater. And a uh, year, um, which a lot of people have mentioned, uh, where politicians are spinning hateful narratives about Muslims and POCs, uh, which is personal to me, it feels easy uh, to feel not just forgotten, but uh, downright unwelcome. Uh, so I try to address some of that in my plays. Uh, but what I can address is how to survive in the industry with a baby. Uh, when we started this family, I was worried people would assume I'd give up writing for the baby, or that when I would accompany Mike to his productions, theaters would mistake me for the nanny instead of acknowledge me as a playwright. Um, so before giving birth, Mike and I emailed all the playwright parents, the greats who came before us, and asked, is it totally crazy to start a family when I'm still emerging? And how do I keep people from assuming shit when I say I'm a mother, wife, or a writer with lady bits? And our icons all took the time to write back and say, um, it's really, really hard, but you won't fail. You won't fade away. What I didn't realize uh, what my aunt said was that you won't fade away because we won't let you. So to my son who is in the audience, I say, take a look around you. I know it's hard because you're only like a month old. <laughs> and you're probably asleep. Uh, but I want you to realize that you are in a room filled with game changers people who understand the power of storytelling and are working to show the full breadth of the human experience and who are making room for complex identities. And I want you to be as thankful and grateful to all of them as I am, especially to the Lilies, for creating a different narrative, for firmly saying, we hear you, we see you, you are welcome here. So,